Okay, awesome. Welcome everyone. My name is Rachel. I am the president of Pre-Med CC, which is a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. From the comfort of wherever you are, our weekly sessions allow you to connect to experts in the field, gain insight on how to prepare for the MCAT, finances, and how to avoid the pitfalls that a lot of pre-med students tend to fall into. After you have attended our event, you can log into our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. And if you score 70% or higher, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. Students that attend all of our sessions this school year will receive a Pre-Med CC Scholar Award for all the hours of shadowing that you have accomplished. Our upcoming events for the rest of the semester through December are on our website, premedcc.org, where you can sign up for them. And feel free to follow us on social media accounts for updates on our future events. And if you guys can't have your cameras on for the session today, we'd love to see your faces, but we also want to respect your privacy and give you the space to leave your camera off if you need to. That being said, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anwar. She arrived in the United States from Iraq as a refugee and enrolled in ESL and science courses at American River College in Sacramento. She then continued her studies at UC Davis, where she majored in neurobiology, physiology, and behavior. Afterwards, she completed a master's degree in biomedical sciences at Midwestern University. She received her DO degree at, from the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine. She has a special interest in patients in critical care and end of life care. She is currently the assistant professor of medicine at University of Arizona Phoenix. Beyond her career, she enjoys spending time with her family, spinning and listening to audiobooks. Here today to talk to us about her amazing journey, Dr. Anwar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, yes, um, you kind of summarized literally my journey, but yes, the, um, I am so happy to be here. This is actually where I started my, my journey and we kind of will go through it and, and talk about you, with you guys about um, what it took, what are some of the hills that we had to climb and how we got where we got here today. So again, yes, is my name is Dr. Anwar, if you're afraid to call me Lisa. And if you have any questions during the session, just uh, raise your hand, put it in the chat. Hopefully someone is keeping track of the chat and you can have my email and phone number, text me, email me, whatever you need. So um, next slide. So I love this picture because uh, kind of when I was thinking about, you know, how, how much it took since we, we started this journey and, and kind of going through the different stops, it's almost like this, this um, trip that you're going through and then you have different experiences, different stops. Uh, like I said, a couple of hills to climb and then finally reach your goal. Next slide. So like um, Rachel mentioned, yes, my journey started in 2006. And for those of you who know me, um, when I came to the US, I was actually at the age of 18. So um, it was this transition between, you know, do we finish high school? Do we not finish high school? What do we do from here? It was a new country, new culture. Um, absolutely no friends. And then there was a, I think one of the hardest things for me when I came was the lack of familiarity with, with the education system because education system here in the United States is much different from where I came from, from Iraq. And I just wasn't sure where to start, how to start, who to talk to. And like I said, it was just too late to graduate high school at that point. I was offered to do some, um, um, I, I believe they used to call it like adult school or, or something, I can't remember. However, <clears throat> I opted to just go ahead and start community college at that point. And I luckily at that time, you didn't need a high school diploma to do that. So you just start community college and, and go from there. So um, some of the 
hardest things when I started was, first of all, I had no driver's license. I did not drive. Um, and my parents didn't have a car at that point either. So literally I was taking the bus everywhere. Luckily the place where we were living, the bus, the bus stop was there. So I would just take the bus to go to school. Um, I enrolled myself in some ESL classes. Now finding a good, finding a good counselor was, that was another whole different story. Just trying to find someone that understand where you're coming from, what are you trying to accomplish and how to get there. And that's when, you know, I started looking at different volunteering positions, uh, financial support programs, and trying to figure out what to major on. I remember I went to a, a American River College one day and I was like, give me the book for the majors. And I, I'm looking through the books and I'm like, well, nothing fits what I want except for nursing. So why don't I just go ahead and take all the nursing classes there is so that I can be prepared for medical school? Little did I know. Well, that's not how it works there are requirements that you have to meet to actually even apply to medical school. So that was a whole different story. And then um, of course you have the uh, beauty of counselors telling you that you'll never get into medical school. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Next slide. And that's when um, there, Juven knows this this woman. Her name is Yolanda. I was at school one day, and, and I, God bless her heart. I think she could tell that I was just so lost that day. And, and she stopped me and she said, "Hey, what are you? You know, what are you looking for?" So I told her, and she said, "Well, you know, why don't you come today? There is there is a, an American Medical Student Association meeting. I think it will be helpful for you." And I I still keep in touch with Yolanda every once in a while on Instagram. But I always told her, I said, if it wasn't for you. Um, I probably would not be where I am here today because she was just so kind. So um, that's when we started going to the meetings. I met a bunch of inspirational people, people that were literally in my shoes. We we're like, you know, young students, didn't know what to do, didn't know where to go, didn't know where to start. And that's when um, I was introduced to Jubin and, and Jubin talked to us about the conference and, and welcomed all these youngsters to go ahead and plan this regional conference, which was so much fun. It was so much fun to plan this conference and, and get to know people. And looking back, I think what was important is that sometimes you just have to see the potential in people, regardless of how young they are, regardless of how naive they are. You just have to find the potential and give them a responsibility and see what they can do with it. And this is what EMSA really provided at that time, which is what exactly what I needed. And I learned that there are different routes to get into medical school. There are, there are requirements to get into medical school and there are steps that you have to take to even apply to medical school. And that's when I finally, I was like, okay, I think my major should be science because that's what I want to do. And of course, you all know that's not the case. Next slide, please. Um, so after going through community college, finishing the required classes, um, and and learning that that's you know you finish your required classes and then you have to go to um, a, a university to receive your bachelor's degrees, and and at that point. I, I knew I could not move from Sacramento. So UC Davis was, was pretty much the optimal option for me. And at that time, it was, it was a matter of, you know, you want to do everything and anything. So it was a matter of trying to balance academics and my volunteering position, which was doing medical records at a, a clinic ended up turning into a job. So I, I kept that job and, and I was blessed that my, boss was extremely understanding. I mean, God bless her heart. She would let me take weeks off to study and days off to study and then just come back whenever you can and we'll, we'll go from there. I was involved at um, a, an underserved community clinic. It was Shifa Clinic. And for those of you at UC Davis, there are different underserved clinics and students got involved depending on how you want to serve. So I was involved with Shifa. I still kept working part-time. And I kept hearing people saying, well, if you wanna to go to medical school, you have to do research. And I'm like, well, okay, fine. So I did find a research position and um, 
not surprisingly, not surprisingly, I, I did not enjoy it. And I knew I wasn't going to enjoy it. So, um, and that maybe we can touch on that now. It's, it's to the point to where like, is this something that I want to put on my CV? Because if I didn't enjoy it and I, it wasn't gratifying for me, am I, am I going to be able to talk about it when in the long run, when we interview? So I did not end up including it on my CV, but we did, we did give it a try. And then of course, through Shifa Clinic, we, you know, I, I ended up getting into leadership positions and, and management positions at the clinic, which, which was a great experience to be able to serve. And then it was MCAT time. So we did take the MCAT. Next slide, please. And uh, it did not go well which I was not shocked because uh, I, it, I was doing too much at that point. I was working in, in the clinic. I was volunteering at a clinic. I uh, was trying to balance and then studying for the MCAT. So sure enough, it did not go well. GPA, again, because of all these reasons, was just an average GPA. Could I have applied to medical school? Maybe. Was it going to be, were there going to be great chances of getting accepted? Mm, I don't know. And at that time, that's when it was, I was in a relationship with my now husband that I knew I was, I was going to move to Phoenix. And then that was the year that we were getting married. So it was time to move to Phoenix. And that's when, uh, next slide, please. This quote really resonated with me. So now you have, you know, a student who is about to graduate college, um, did not do well on the MCAT, GPA not good enough. And I'm like, well, I still want to be a doctor. So what do we do from here? And I love this quote because it kind of fits, it fits this picture. It says, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. And the realist adjust the sales and really that's a lot of the times what we have to do in our in our medical journey it's i mean you can be it's okay to be a pessimist i mean that's okay but um there's only so much you can get from complaining and i i, I love don't get me wrong sometimes i love to complain but what what are we going to do with that and then uh, sitting there and, and and expecting that oh well just things will work out again through the higher power, maybe that's something that's acceptable, but sometimes you just have to adjust your expectations to get where you need to get. Next step, please, or next slide. And that's when I was like, what do people do between medical school, between, between undergraduate and, and graduate programs? And I remember when I was at UC Davis, um, there were some students in my, physiology class who kept saying we are in a post back program. And I'm like, what the heck is a post back program? So that's when I looked up post back programs and I ended up finding a quote unquote post back program at Midwestern University, which is in Arizona. And that's where, that's where I was going to move anyways. So I looked through the requirements. I looked through their mission. I learned about what post back programs do. And I was like, well, that sounds like a good idea. And I was terrified of taking a year off. That was my fear. I said, if I take a year off, I'm going to lose my inertia and this is the end of my career. So I did end up applying for the program. Now talking about pros and cons of post back programs for those of you who are interested in, in post back programs. And, and each step of the career has pros and cons. So like community college, pros, I, I loved how it was small, classes were small, you get to know your faculty, you get to make connections, you can be involved. Um, it's, the curriculum is a little bit more uh, manageable. You can have a job, you and, and go to school classes are a little bit more flexible um now depending on where you look some people will say well it's maybe frowned upon to go to to community college but um given the circumstances where i was and the cost of course community colleges are much cheaper than universities that was the best fit for me 
and and I played the the cards that I was handed. Um, as far as UC Davis goes, UC Davis was a great experience for me. I I mean it was a shock because you're going from classes of twenty to twenty five students to classes of two hundred. Um, or even maybe even more than 200 students. It was extremely difficult to find resources sometimes because of how big the university is. So you really have to advocate for yourself. Um, but as a, as a school, I, I cherished my time at, at UC Davis. post back programs, depending on which program you do, the one that I particularly did at Midwestern University, the curriculum was extremely robust. And, and it almost stimulated the curriculum at, at, at the medical school. So we were being preconditioned for medical school. And then it really helps with connections again and getting these letters of recommendations. However, it is expensive. I mean, the post back program, I mean, I don't know what the cost is now, but I think by the time I did it in 2012, 2012, it was, 70 or, or $60,000. Next step or next slide. Um, and I think there is a question in the chat. Oh, it's the, about the access about the presentation. So maybe Rachel or, or Jubin can, can help with that. Um, thank you for being here, Rashmi. And for those of you who don't know, Rashmi is, is uh, one of the volunteers that actually volunteered at our hospital and, and uh, now working on her journey to apply to medical school. So thank you for being here. I know you're busy. So uh, now we are, it's 2012, 2013. And um, it's that time of the year, Again, I'm like, okay, well, this, I'm in the post back program. What do we do now? So I did end up applying for local medical schools. I thought, well, worst case scenario, I do not get in, but we tried. Uh, best case scenario is I finish the program and then I start medical school. At that time, priorities really have changed for me. It was no longer about getting being. Um, doing extracurricular activities. It was no longer about um, what else is there that I could do. It was more of like, I need to focus on academia because I know this is the reason why I'm in this program. So thankfully, I mean, that's what we did. And, and my GPA was, I did very well in the, in the post back program. And then it was time for me when I met with, with the faculty at that time. My MCAT, I did have to retake my MCAT. So I waited till before the end of the program and took my MCAT in June and the program thankfully helped to study for the MCAT. Next slide. And for those of you who are taking the MCAT, now I know the MCAT has changed. It's, it's not the same as when I took it in, in 2013. Um, but the key is just questions and then that's what i re what i realized when i took it the second time there's there's only so many ways that they can ask you these questions and it's a matter of recognizing these patterns and what are they trying to get at um i did get a prep course and actually i i, I got the prep course when i was with with emsa as one of the incentives when i did the conference and i utilized it very well but you have to find what works. You'll go through, I think the forum, it was called like studentdoctor.com, which was like the worst idea. Like when I used to go back and check, what do people have to get to get into medical school? And, and what do I have to study for? And it's, there's an overwhelming amount of information. Um, but you have to find what works. And for me, there were like two resources maybe that, that I, I told myself that I need to learn very well and then questions, 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 whatever these resources are. Some people will tell you it's Kaplan. Some people will tell you it's, I don't know, what is the other one, Princeton. Some people will tell you it's the um, questions on the, I can't remember if it was like the AMA, but there was a question bank that you could use. Um, but find what works and practice because 
all the, the information and in all these resources is the same. It's a matter of like, what can you connect with? So find that. Um, so again, yeah, more resources does not necessarily mean better. And I took my MCAT in June of 2013 and I had applied to start for medical school for that cycle. So next slide, please. I remember getting my score sometime like a couple days before July 24th. So I called the medical school and I said, hey, uh, you know, in case you were looking for my MCAT score and in case you have not received it, this is my new score and I can send you the report. Is there any way that I can still start medical school this year? And I loved it of that. Finally, and I still, I had that voicemail saved in my phone because on July 24th, 2013, it was, I think like two in the afternoon, my husband and I were chilling in the living room and I got a phone call from, from ASCOM and I'm like, oh my God. So I picked up the phone, I picked up the phone and they said, well, we have a seat for the next, for this cycle and, and school starts next week. Would you be willing to take that seat? And I was like, yeah, of course I'll take that seat. So, you know, I, I did end up getting into medical school that day. I started medical school the following week. And that's when, um, you know, it all started, this new journey started. Next slide, please. So through that, you, the only thing that I can tell you is that this, if you were to ask me, would you do this all over again? I would say yes, because I, I, I do. But I would probably pick redoing medical school over redoing, um, like having to apply through med to medical school and having um, to go through um, the admission process because that was just, it was the hardest thing that I, that I could have done at that point, it was difficult. So stay persistent and have the courage to walk your fear, the fear of what if I don't get in? What if I don't score well? What if they don't like me? It doesn't matter. Like just walk your fear, take a leap of faith. Sometimes that can cost money. Sometimes that can cost time. Sometimes that can cost you a little bit of family time, but take a leap of faith, just try and you don't know until you try and do your best of course next slide and then medical school started and i thought the master's program prepared me for medical school but oh boy we started medical schools and these hours were so long study 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 you're sitting in the classroom and that was of course before covid for many hours during the day you come home and each professor has given you I don't know, 50, 60 slides that you have to learn. You have exams every single Monday. Sometimes it was like every Monday and Friday. Um, kiss my social life goodbye. I was, um, I, I still am very blessed that my husband is extremely supportive. So if he needed to go somewhere and I couldn't, it's like, just don't worry about it. You do you, I'll see you after. I think we, he ate Carl's Jr's at McDonald's for a few years. Um, and, and that was okay with us. We didn't, we had talked about it and we knew it was something that was temporary. I think one of the hardest thing when you look at this whole picture is like, is this how my life is going to look forever? And no, you're not going to be sitting and studying for long hours for the rest of your life. I mean, being a physician, you're a lifelong learner, but it's not like you have a test every single week. No, you do not have to eat fast food if you don't want to every single day. And no, you don't have to miss on social events and, and important family events for the rest of your life. Um, my medical school is a DO school. Um, so I did take the complex, the complex one and I passed. And I, and I, at that time, I didn't know what I wanted to do for residency. I was like, well, might as well just take the USMLE one and, and see what happens just in case. And I also passed the USMLEs. And it was third year of medical school and that was baby time. I was like, well, if we're not gonna have a baby right now, I don't, I don't wanna have a baby during residency. So we are going to have a baby. And that's when Joshua was born. He was born 
right at the end of my third year of medical school. I, I remember I had a cardiology exam that Friday. Joshua gave me Saturday and then Sunday we were at church, we left church and, and we went to the hospital and had him. So that brought its own challenges, right? Because now you're not sleeping um, because I mean, you have, you have a newborn, they don't sleep, so you don't sleep. And childcare for us, we were blessed because we had family around. So Joshua was, you know, if he wasn't with my husband, he was with my mother-in-law. If he wasn't with my mother-in-law, he was with my husband's aunt. My parents would come and visit every once in a while. So it's, it's, it, we were blessed. I mean, we managed. And then um, I don't know if we have any mamas in the groups today, but then pumping during medical school and, and rotations was a whole other challenge of like, where do I go? Are there rooms to do this? Um, so those are some of the challenges that I, that I found as a mom in medical school. Um, and then traveling for interviews, um, that was another challenge because now we're like, well, where do I, where do I want to go? Um, and do they come with me? Do they stay home? If they stay home, how do I like make sure that the, he's taken care of while I'm gone? So these were some of the challenges. And of course, it was time to take the complex too. Uh, I was told one day, I was like, I asked the question, I said, how do you know if you're ready to take, whether it's the MCAT, whether it's your boards, how do you know you're ready? Um, and it, you don't just take them to get them over with. And I think that's what happened with me with Comlex too. I took the Comlex because I wanted to get it over with. And I thought I, I was going to be okay. However, I took it and I failed. So I, and that was six weeks after I had Joshua. And I'm like, well, I shouldn't have been there to start with. Why would, you know, a mom who's supposed to Adam, who's not been sleeping, who's not been able to study to go and take one of her board exams. Bad idea. So I would not recommend doing that. So we did fail the complex. And I thought at that point that, oh my God, like I cannot take more time off because I've already used my quote unquote maternity leave, which is really not a maternity leave. Uh, now I failed my complex. Uh, I need to graduate. So what do we do from here? And you take, I literally ended up taking a step back of like, what is the most important thing here? And it's finishing medical school. It's not a matter of when, like it didn't really matter to me. I'm like, well, if I have to stay an extra year, then be it, who cares? Let's stay an extra year. So I did end up studying again for the complex and, and really utilized what I did when I was studying for the MCAT. It's not about reading the books and reading the books. It's about, am I able to apply this? So I just did questions, 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 question bank. And, and um, sometimes the other advice is, is you do a question bank and you get so familiar with this with the questions that you start memorizing the answers. So at that point, I would recommend to all of you to finding another question bank to kind of shift your bias so that you can look at it from a different angle and really um, examine whether you know the information or not. And that's what I did. And thankfully we did, we did pass the complex that year. Um, and again, it didn't matter to me. My purpose was much bigger than scores. My purpose was much bigger than graduating in the same medical medical school class that I was with. We just needed to make it work. And one of the best advices that I was given was you just have to stay persistent and keep your eye on the prize. What is the prize that you want and, and make it work. Um, so I did end up going through the match. And for those, those of you who don't know, after, before you complete medical school and, and you choose the specialty that you want to apply for, you go through the match process. And in, in the match process, you go in and you interview at all these different hospitals and programs, and then they ask you to rank. Um, 
you know, if you've had five interviews and, and you loved all these five interviews, then you rank one through five, one being your, your higher choice and then five being your lower, your lowest. So I did end up matching in the, in my number one choice that year and it was internal medicine residency program. And not only that I matched my number one, but I also matched with a failed complex score and I matched into an MD residency program. It was, it was, um, um, Initially it was a DO program, but then it went through the credentialing and they ended up gaining ACGME. So it was an MD program. So the point here is not to, it was not by chance that you, you have to stay authentic and prevent and present yourself as who you are and what's important to you and how, what, it, what it took you to get where you are. And people see that. I was fortunate that the program director when I interviewed and I, I loved his program, he saw that. He saw that even if you fail, you try again and you rise back up and, and, and you continue. And I was fortunate to be there. So it worked out, we matched. It was still in Arizona because I did not want to move at that point. Um, and that was the picture of me, my hubby and, and, and Joshua on match day, there was this huge celebration. It's a lot of fun. Next slide. <clears throat> and that was graduation day. And that day when I was in medical school, you know, and, and one of my lowest days, I, I told myself, I said, I wonder if I will ever graduate because I've had a couple of setbacks and, and this picture meant the world to me, not because being a physician does not define me. Um, Lisa defines me and, and Lisa comes with a package and I chose my package to be, a, you know, a, a wife, a mom and a physician and a family member who shows up when, when family needs me. I mean, I'm not there all the time, but if someone needs me, I will show up to my family and friends. And, and you know, I was thankful that I have met so many people that saw the, this, this potential and knew what was important to me. At that point, I'm like, the heck with it. I'm then trying to fit in. I just need to see where I belong. And that's where we're going. Next slide. And that's when residency started. And that was a whole different ball game. Like you're working anywhere between 60 to 80 hours a week. Uh, the learning curve is huge. I mean, you're finishing medical school, you start a residency and people just think that you know everything. And I'm like, I don't know, like, no, like this is why we're in training. Um, some of the hardest things about residency is you really have to be okay receiving constructive criticism. So that's one thing that you can train yourself right now is um, whose opinion is valuable to me and whose opinion is a, um, what they call is a cheap, like a cheap chair, like a opinion where it's, it's not meaningful, it's not valuable, and it does not contribute to growth. And that's when you kind of have to look at who matters to me in my training? Which attending matters? And what is the feedback that I'm receiving? And is this feedback true? And what can I learn from it? And what can I leave out of it? Uh, so that was that was another thing that we, you know, I really had to learn in residency. And um, I, I, and I told my residency program, I said, it's one of my pet peeves when people tell me that, well, you're so nice. And I'm like, this is not helpful. Like, how's that helpful to me? Like, I don't want to hear that I'm nice. Um, is there something that I need to work on? What can we do to make this better? Um, leadership somehow followed me. I, you know, whether it was in community college, whether it was at UC Davis, um, and now in residency, leadership followed. And I found myself um, in these committees, whether it was a patient safety committee, whether it was a graduate medical education committees, whether it was wellness committees. And one thing I can tell you is learn your boundaries of when to say no, 
but also if someone approaches you about an opportunity, uh, evaluate and see, is, is this important to me? Can I be helpful here? Um, and, and maybe take it because one time I was told, I said, you know, um, if you keep saying no, then you'll stop being asked to do things. And, and, um, Juben, when I was in, in community college, I remember one thing you said at that point, you said half of life is showing up, right? You sometimes have to just show up and see what, what comes, what comes with that opportunity. Um, so I did, and I was asked to be chief resident in my residency program. So I did a chief year, and that's when I really got involved in, 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 in graduate medical education. And why do we do things a certain way in residency programs? And how do we get evaluated? And, and what makes a program a good program? And what makes a program a bad program? My, my advice to you where you are right now is when you go to interview, for residency program, really pay attention to how are the residents doing? Are they are they getting along with each other? Um, um, is the program supportive? If you do not see yourself there, do not rank them because you don't want to be miserable for three years. And you have more choices when it comes to residency than medical school. Medical school, it's like heck, whatever whoever takes me, I'll go. Uh, but residency, you have a little bit more. Um, freedom per se. And then during my third year of residency, um, I, at that point I was, I, I still am, I, I, I was like, I want to do critical care. So I'm going to apply for fellowship now. Um, next slide, please. So I did apply for fellowship and I applied for pulmonary critical care fellowships. Uh, however, I did not match. Uh, I know why I did not match. It's because um, I did. I applied to only a few programs. Pulmonary critical care is, is a little bit more competitive. Um, I really did not want to go to the East Coast. The majority of these programs and are in the East Coast. But again, I took a leap of faith. I'm like, let's apply and see what happens. Um, well, the critical care program that I wanted to match at it was here in phoenix which it was the at the university of arizona so the day that i found out that i didn't match i called the university and i said hey uh did you fill your hospice and palliative medicine program because i thought well i knew i didn't want to work with my with internal medicine you could do primary care you could do hospitalist which is just hospital medicine you can do I don't know, administration, you could do academia, you could do a lot of things, but I, I knew that I did not want uh, to do that at that point. I wanted to continue with training um, and I wanted to take my boards. So I studied for the boards at that time. And then I called the program and I said, hey, did you fill your palliative medicine? And for those of you who don't know palliative medicine, is basically a specialty of internal medicine. You could do it through family medicine as well, where you are dealing with patients who are either at the end of their lives or patients with critical medical conditions, whether it's cancer, advanced liver, advanced heart, advanced lung disease. And we focus on their symptoms. We focus on quality of life and their goals. So I said, this would be a great uh, addition to critical care if I was to do critical care. Well, I did palliative medicine and I absolutely fell in love with it. And I was like, well, this is where I belong. This is what I want to do with my life. Um, it's a privilege to be able to do this job. So this is what we're doing. And then next slide. And then during uh, fellowship, I still... Um, was involved in leadership. Um, so I was still involved in wellness because whether it's medical students, residents, fellow wellness is important to me. I think we just don't pay attention to it. And I was so done with this whole BS of like, oh, here, do yoga. Oh, here, um, gift card to a restaurant. Oh, here, uh, let's talk about our feelings. Those are important things, but 
through resident wellness and, and listening to the residents and the medical students and, and the fellows and, and addressing their concerns and, um, and advocating, like taking that to the higher ups of like, hey, look, like you have residents who are working over hour during COVID and they're frustrated because they're not getting paid more for this time. Like, what are you gonna do about it? And, and you'd be surprised, people listen. Uh, you have residents who are telling you, well, I need to go see a therapist, but if you're working me to death, how am I gonna go see a therapist? So bring a therapist to the hospital so they can go and knock on their door and go see them. So you'd be surprised. You just have to, you know, ruffle some feathers and things get done. Uh, however, I also realized that you might think that you're a good leader, but then how do you really know? So that's when I ended up getting um, myself into a leadership training course. To, to focus, to kind of fine tune these leadership skills, uh, focusing on what I'm really good at, because at this time, there's only so much you could do to, um, like you can always improve, but I also bring a lot to the table. So why don't I just utilize my strengths to whether it's the hospital system, whether it's the medical teams, whether it's medical education and, and go from there. And that's when I really also got interested in medical ethics, um, because I think that there are a lot of things that we do in medicine that are not necessarily, I mean, I don't want to say not necessarily ethical, but um, they're, they're, it's not black and white. And sometimes you have to kind of step back, take the emotions out and say, okay, what is the most ethical solution here? And that's when I was involved in ethics. And finally, I finished fellowship and I was offered a job at the same fellowship program where I trained. Um, so I happily took the job because I, I knew I wanted to be in academia. I knew I wanted to be involved with medical students, residents and fellows. I knew I was not okay with being in my comfort zone. So I wanted somewhere to where I, I, I wanted to be somewhere where I can be challenged, uh, whether it's with the cases, whether it's with the uh, business of medicine, whether it's with um, dynamics in the teams. So I, I ended up taking the job as a junior faculty um, at the University of Arizona, Phoenix. So, next slide. If you kind of, even if we go back to like the very first picture that I showed you and, and kind of look, whether it's my journey, your journey, your friend's journey, um, our journeys are going to be different. However, <clears throat> sometimes it's helpful to know your values. So what is the most important thing to you? Is it courage? Is it, you know, productivity? Is it compassion? Whatever that is. And use that as your moral compass, you know, because the winds are going to keep blowing around you and you cannot just move back and forth with this wind. You kind of have to stay centered. Sometimes it's important to know your values where and where you belong, okay? Because... A lot of the times in our pre-medical, uh, pre-med career, we are just trying to fit in. Like, where do I fit in? And, and you have to get to a point in your life to are like, I don't want to fit in anymore. I want to belong somewhere. And whether that's in the, medical, in the community college, whether that's at the university, whether that's in the uh, extracurriculum activities that you're doing. And I gave you the example of, of research. I was trying really hard to fit in but I did not belong there. Um, and find good mentors. Um, keep, keep in touch with these mentors uh, and pay forward, right? Like I, I told you when I talk about Yolanda and when I talk about Juban and everyone else that I met, that, that I met in EMSA, um, it was not just, a, it was a chapter in my life, but it was not something that I had to do. These, these were meaningful connections that we made. And, and you'd be surprised, this world is so small. So be kind, 
find good mentors and pay it forward to your colleagues. Uh, stay involved. Um, medicine is not about doing, you know, four years of, of college and then four years of, of medical school and then residency. Stay involved, like see what's out there. What interests you in medicine? It's, we're really focusing on this like patient-centered care. And you can't do that if, if, we don't, if we're not very resourceful. Um, and counselors are not always right. So I wish I could go back and tell my counselor, hey, look, I did get into medical school. I graduated and, and did residency and now I'm working, but I, don't, I can't even remember her name. And then find people that can advocate for you, okay? So when you're asking for your letters of recommendations, feel comfortable asking, hey, do you think you can write me a good letter of recommendation? And, and clear is kind. If the person says no, then it's a no. It's, it's better to have fewer letters than, than too many shitty letters. So just find solid letters for, from people who can advocate for you and then stay authentic be yourself when you go to your interviews don't be afraid at the, at the end of the interview and that's what I did when I interviewed for medical school and I told them I said I'm sure you do have a lot of competitive candidates in your program however being here is important to me it's important to me to stay in this community it's important to me to stay local it's important to me to be with my husband otherwise you know, these, these are all reasons for me to succeed, okay? So I will be fully invested in your program. And people see that. You're not begging. You're just stating what you want. Um, so yeah, you are your best advocate. So advocate yourself. And then finally, um, throughout this whole thing, you will be criticized. You'll have people telling you that you might not make it. You have people who will tell you, well, this is too hard. For those of you who, women in our panel today, people will tell you, well, you know, as a woman, I don't think you should do this because, you know, you need to take care of your family, you need to have babies. And I'm like, okay, the heck with it. So my inspiration throughout this whole thing, and, and there's another quote that I wanted to share with you guys, and this is my next slide. And this is by... Um, um, Roosevelt and this quote says it says it's the man in the arena and for those of you who have not read Dare to Lead I highly recommend you reading this book because it will serve you well in any stage of your life and it says it's not counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer deeds could have done them better the credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena whose face is mirrored by dust and sweat and blood, who strive violently, who errs and comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who best, who best knows in the end the trumpet of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails at least, he, uh, at least he fails while daring greatly. So that's his place shall never be with those whose cold timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. The reason why I'm sharing this with you is because to succeed, you will have some setbacks. And that's where people who have who can offer you valuable opinions matter, right? Because the critique, again, their opinions are not going to be as valuable to you and you will have critiques through your career, but they're not the ones who are fighting with you. They're not the ones who are struggling in their classes. They're not the ones who have to work to apply and, and, and pay for their applications. They're not the ones who have to give a family time. Um, they're just not. So, it's okay to have setbacks. It's okay to fail a test or two because it's not the end of the world. The only people who do not make it to medical school 
I would, uh, I think, I don't know. There are a lot of circumstances, of course, but I think it's maybe life can happen, but maybe the people who did not try like hard enough and sometimes hard enough can be years and years and years. And, and I'm not saying that medical school is the only option. If it's not something that you want to do, then don't do it. It's okay. There are other options. You can serve and, and be who you are in other areas. And we're all in this together. So I think this, I believe this was the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? I, I, I think I did a lot of talking and I'm so sorry. You guys, we left the thing open. So if you guys just want to ask questions, if you don't want to type, you can do that. Or you could type in either the chat or the question and answer. Um, it's kind of your time. So you could unmute yourself and ask the question or um, you can uh, type the questions. It's also okay not to have questions. You don't have to ask a question. That's okay. But let me send you my, uh, here, let me send you my email. So feel free to also email me in case something comes up. Uh, so this is my email. I have some questions actually that we've been asked in some of our previous sessions that I think are pretty good questions if you're okay with me asking those. Yeah, of course. All right, one question was, what is the biggest way that you think being a doctor has affected your life? Um, honestly, I think it made me a better, so when I think about being a doctor, right? And I talk, I talk about this with my husband all the time, I think it, it changed my priorities. I think it made me who I am today. And again, I think I'm a better um, person because of my job. I mean, like I said, like with palliative medicine, you really, there are only few things that matter to us in life. So it helped me kind of look at people from the lens of love. You look at someone and everyone is fighting a battle and you all of a sudden, once you've experienced so many difficult and heavy scenarios, you try to become less judgmental. You try to kind of sit back and listen, like listen to what this person is saying and whether that's a patient, whether that's a family member, whether that's a friend, uh, because we always, when someone is talking to us, we're like getting prepared to give answers, right? But what this, what being in medicine and, and doing the specialty that I'm doing, it really helped me kind of step back and listen to people. You'd be surprised how therapeutic it is when you actually just sit back and listen. So I, I mean, I don't know. I, I like to believe that my, uh, me being in medicine kind of shape the person that I am today. And this may change in a few years or it may stay, but for now, I, I couldn't be happier. One person typed the question, what advice do you have to community college students making the transition to a large for your university? Yeah, and that's, um, <laughs> so number one, um, Again, find resources. So whether that's through different clubs in, in the community call in the, in the university, whether that's surrounding yourself by people with a common purpose. Um, so find resources, number one. Number two, depending on your financial status, um, sometimes working may be something that you have to do. So look at your schedule. You don't have to graduate university within this, like within the like two years. So just look at your schedule and do something that's realistic so you can succeed in your classes and still maintain a job. If you have the privilege of not having to work, that's even better than just focus on your classes. 
Um, the other thing is, um, what else? When I was in community, when I was at university, so like job resources, and then um, like volunteering activities, whether it's like clinics, whether it's uh, internships, what, whatever that is. So just find some volunteering activities, and if you can afford taking time between um, university and graduate school, whatever that graduate school is, take that time, you know, if you want to travel, if you want to have a family, if you want to focus on yourself, it's okay to take time. Like no one said this has to be done within, I don't know, eight years. It could be, it could be longer as long as you're well. So, and then the other thing is for me also when I was applying to university is there are programs that help with tuitions. And I was lucky that I had learned about some of these programs so that you're not carrying that burden of having to pay, you know, for everything if you qualify for some of these assistance programs. So uh, look into that. And I don't know, like, again, this was like almost 10 years ago. So I'm sure some of you guys who just graduated college may have different advice. So please feel free to chime in and help answer the question. So another follow-up question on that was how long did you spend at a community college and how long did it take you to become a doctor? Yeah, the, so I was afraid this was gonna come up. <laughs> So because I had no idea what the heck I was doing uh, and take it just random classes when I started college, it took actually, I started community college in 2006. I finished community college in 2010 because I, between the English classes and the algebra and finishing up my chemistry and organic chemistry and physics, uh, it took me four years to finish community college. However, um, I was a little bit more uh, aware of what you need to do when I started UC Davis. So I finished UC Davis in two years. So between community college and Davis, it was a total of six. So between 2006 and 2012, and that's when I graduated UC Davis. And then the master's program was one year. So that was seven. Was it seven? Yes, seven years. And then medical school is four years. So that's 11, but it doesn't have to be that long. It just, it happened to be that long for me. And another question, would you recommend taking a gap year between undergrad and med school? Yes, I do, actually. I do recommend taking a gap year. Uh, I was afraid of taking a gap year because, um, I like security. And I, when I graduated Davis, as I was moving to a new state from California to Arizona, I worried that I was going to get lost in life. I was going to get lazy, um, but that's not necessarily the case. And once I started medical school, there's no there's no coming back. Like, I mean, yes, there is. However, like if you want to finish medical school, you do have to finish it. Um, and it's mentally fatiguing because you're in classes, you're taking exams, you're taking your boards, competition, um, rotations, audition rotations. It's very mentally exhausting. So yeah, if you can take a year off to travel to get your finances together, to start a family, to be with family, to be by yourself. I don't know, watch Netflix, sleep, whatever the heck you want. I don't know, take a year off. Yeah. And have you experienced burnout and what is your biggest piece of advice for burnout when you do get it? Yeah, burnout is a real thing. And um, so 
compassion fatigue and physician burnout, medical student burnout, college student burnout is a real thing. And that's why wellness was my, and still is my thing, even as an attending, I'm part of the wellness committee. Um, the antidote to burnout is learning how to empathize. So um, again, doing your best in the moment and not beating yourself for it after. And one example of burnout that I can give you is, it was during COVID actually. And we had to do a lot of the difficult conversations over the phone. We were FaceTiming family members to show them their loved ones who was passing over the phone. And I remember coming home that day after I FaceTimed this wife telling her that your husband is dying, do you wanna say bye to him? And I FaceTimed him from my own cell phone and she called me back and, and we talked a little bit over the phone and I came home and I'm like literally making myself an omelet. And I was like, I can't believe that I changed this woman's life completely over a FaceTime and I don't even know her. And then I carried on with my life and I'm making myself an omelet. And I spoke to one of the chaplains and I said, how do you not feel this? Because it's not sustainable with life. This is not sustainable. I mean, you can be compassionate, but this, I mean, I still have to take care of me and my family. And she said, Lisa, you always have to try. You just do your best at that moment. And by doing your best, you learn how to empathize. You ask questions, you debrief with your team members and your friends and talk to them. Um, so that's some, and, and like in my little biography, I, I do love to spin, sweating on the bike. That was like, and still is. I mean, I was there this morning. One of my favorite things to do, um, listening to audible books, fascinating, hanging out with my little you know boy and, and my husband and snuggling and laughing. Like if you can laugh, just laugh. Um, and reminding myself when I walk into a patient's room or when I'm talking to family and friends that I need to do my best with you right now because I cannot bring that moment back. And once this moment is done, then, then that's it, we move on. So long, the short answer is uh, do what you love, talk to people and do your best and empathize with other people. And then does I it, think we have does one. It, does, anybody have any, does anybody have any other questions want to ask or type? What about you, Rachel? I was going to ask about how you balanced motherhood and school. That sounds absolutely crazy. It's crazy. It still is crazy. I can't believe it. Even now when I'm pregnant and, and working, I'm like, oh my God, this is nuts. Um, I did not balance the best. I'm not going to lie to you. I, um, mom guilt was real. Okay. But again, it's because I did not empathize. And sometimes you have to empathize with yourself. You have to be nice to yourself. And I wasn't very nice to myself during medical school. Like I talked to myself in a way, uh, that I would never speak that way with a child, with a family member, like I was not nice to myself, right? And actually, once I learned that you are doing, you're doing your best, you're a medical student, you're studying, you're taking exams, you're trying to pump uh, during, on your time off, you're trying to do interviews, you come home, and you just love your baby, and, and you feed your baby, and, and that's what you could do. And now I remind myself of this. I'm like, Joshua, if I cannot pick you up early from school, it's because mommy's working. Mommy loves you so much. When I see you, we'll spend some time together. And if I see anyone out in the street doing this, I'm like, hey, high five. You know, you're doing your best. So why can't I tell this to myself? Like, I am doing my best. So just trying to remind myself I'm doing my best. My best may be not your best. But uh, yeah, 
it is what it is. Like the house does not have to be clean. Um, we don't have to eat to eat a cooked meal every single day. We can go out and eat. Um, 20 minutes of snuggling is not going to stop the world. Like it's okay to just step, step away for 20 minutes and snuggle and talk. And, and that's what people remember. Like it's not how long you spend, it's how did you spend it? But I'm doing it again. Apparently I did not learn my lesson, so. <laughs> All right, and so if we don't have any more questions, I think we're gonna let everyone go. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. That was amazing. Yeah. So to access the quiz after the event, you guys can go back onto our website, which is premedcc.org, select the event you attended and take the quiz. And if you pass the quiz with a 70% or higher, you will be awarded your certificate. And now you have proof of those hours that you spent investing in your future as a pre-med student. And if anyone you know wanted to be here today and wasn't able to, the recording will be on our YouTube channel. So I want to thank everyone for coming. And of course, to Dr. Anwar for your time and answering all of our questions. Yes, of course. Of course. Best of luck to you all. Reach out if you have any questions. And uh, this will all be a story to tell. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing you, Lisa. Bye. Thank you, Jubin. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.